Good morning, everybody. It's 12 sharp and we should start. So first of all, welcome to this uh, VDB webinar series. Uh, today we have uh, the pleasure of having three speakers who are going to present uh, an overview of the work done within the special project, uh, which addresses uh, the contradiction between big data innovation and data protection compliance requirements. So therefore, uh, we are going to hear today uh, their take on how to tackle some of the issues that many of us are struggling with when dealing with data intensive applications. Uh, for instance, uh, the right use and compliance with GDPR, the support with uh, to get the user consent at the data collection time, et cetera, et cetera. But before that, uh, allow me just to say a few words about uh, this particular uh, BDB uh, webinar series. So, Sorry. Uh, so some, this webinar is part of the, uh, as I mentioned, of this BDB series of webinars where we are inviting speakers from different organizations and, and projects, innovation projects, research and innovation projects, and, the, and other type of projects as well, to talk about their experience working with uh, big data and AI. And by the way, I take this opportunity to invite uh, you uh, to contact me anytime in case you believe you have a topic of interest. Uh, that I would like uh, to be a speaker of uh, one of our upcoming webinars. So the goal of these webinars, as you can see on the screen, is to show the value of uh, big data uh, from the technical and business perspectives, as well as touching some other topic of interest for our community, such as lesson learns, best practices, innovative solutions, societal, societal debates, or even this one about the uh, GDPR issues that is cross-cutting somehow to many aspects. So the, we run at least one webinar per month, uh, typically on Tuesdays, all, although this is not the case in this particular case, but normally it's on Tuesdays at 12, uh, at 12 uh, Central European time. So stay tuned for the schedule of the, of the, of the coming webinars. In particular, we have two webinars bef uh, more before the end of, the, of this year. We have uh, one next Tuesday. Uh, with a special interest for, for startups and SMEs uh, because it's going to provide some input about how to get investors ready. And another one in December 17th uh, about the impact of big data in the Invite economy. Uh, and in that case, we will be showcasing the results and the lesson learned from the Data Bio project because it's actually finishing at the end of the year and, and I have uh, the feeling that they have a lot, of a lot to share with the community. So please, if you're interested to go uh, to attend to one of the webinars, please go to our webinar web page, uh, which is here in the, in the slide, and register to the webinars. And you will find in this URL also the, the historical archive of webinars, plus uh, some hints about the, the future webinars. So some practical issues and housekeeping before jumping into the webinar. Uh, so if you have any questions to the, to the speakers, please write the questions in the chat. You will have a, a way to write questions there. And at the end of the presentation, uh, I will pick uh, the, the ones, so if we have uh, some of them, I will pick some and, and uh, ask to the, to the speakers uh, your own questions. Uh, I'm going to ask you now a couple of, uh, of questions before jumping to the webinar. Uh, let me check one second. And uh, yeah, uh, I have a, a, a poll uh, where you can answer and uh, is just to check the main interest of the audience uh, to give some feedback to our speakers before they start the presentation and to know you well and, and then and therefore try to adjust the presentation to to the audience and also you will have a brief survey at the end of the webinar asking to a, a couple of questions just uh, as feedback and recommendation for us for the future so let me open the first of the questions It is open now, and this first question of the poll is about your profile. So please let us know if you are more interested in technical aspects or you are more in the business side of the application of big data uh, and AI. So I give you a, a few more seconds to ask. I see that people are answering now. Uh, let, let me give you a couple of more seconds, and I will close the poll. Okay, I'm closing now. And I would say that uh, around 70% of people are uh, mostly interested in, in, in technical aspects, although also 40% are, are interested in business aspects. So we have a mixed audience, although more technical than, than business-oriented. And the second question, let me start the poll again. 
again, the second Alan question, is about, um, uh, is more related to the subject of this particular webinar. So is your, organiza your organization applying today all the necessary pri privacy preserving techniques, such as compliance with the GDPR, or you are doing your best, but you are still struggling with uh, all, of, all of this, or it's not really a priority for your organization. So um, I see that uh, you're answering now. I give you again a, a few more seconds. Okay, I see that most of the people already answer, so I'm closing now. And apparently, most of you are already applying the, the, the techniques, 83%. Uh, 11% are still struggling, and only 6% are, are stating that it's not a priority for them. So I think that that's, uh, that's a good input also for our, for our speakers. So thanks, thank you for answering. So let me go without further delay to introduce the, the presenters today. Uh, we have the pleasure, as I said at the beginning, to have in three speakers from the special project. We have uh, Sabrina Kirain from the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Uh, and business. Sabrina uh, is the scientific and technical coordinator of uh, the special project, and she is going to give us an overview of, uh, of the project. After that, we have, we'll have uh, Juros Milosevic, which is a semantic technology architect and, and product manager at Tenforce. And he's going to explain uh, some technical details of uh, the backend solution deploy, the, the developed uh, within the special project. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Philip Traske, which is a researcher in the service-centric networking at the TU Berlin, who is going to give us an overview of the privacy dashboard developed within the project. So let me hand now over to, Sa to Sabrina the, the presentation. Let me make you Sabrina a presenter, one second. Okay, Sabrina, now you, you, can, you can share your screen and the floor is yours. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay, so um, I have the pleasure of giving you the uh, high-level overview of our scalable policy-aware linked data architecture for privacy, transparency and compliance uh, project, which is a research and innovation action uh, funded under ICT18, and we refer to it as simply special. So essentially, um, sorry, I just... Essentially, in terms of special, the, the main aim is to help companies to comply with the General Data Protection Regulation. And uh, we have three stakeholder groups. So we have the data subjects themselves who would like to have more control um, over the processing of their personal data and more transparency with respect to that processing. And we have the regulators. So essentially, uh, we have the GDPR in place and the regulators need to enforce uh, this regulation. So can we actually uh, help them in doing so? And then also we have the companies uh, who uh, their businesses are essentially relying on um, personal data and they want to be able to continue to innovate now that we have the GDPR in place. So to just give you a high level overview of the consortium. On this particular slide, on, on my left-hand side, we see uh, ULD. ULD are a data protection supervisory authority in Northern Kiel. And essentially, they're in the project to look after the interests of the data subjects, us guys, the citizens. And on the business side, we have three companies uh, who have use cases based on big data. We have Thomson Reuters, who... Um, are now known as Refinitiv. We have Deutsche Telekom and we have Proximus. And essentially, what we're looking to do is we're looking to represent um, consent using a machine readable policy language, represent um, legislation using a policy language, and also represent business processes or 
um, the processing performed by those applications uh, using a machine readable format so that we can automatically provide transparency and compliance checking. And down the bottom, we have all of the technical partners of the project. Just to give you a very quick overview of the use cases that we have in this project, the first one is Proximus. And Proximus would like to develop a new application where they provide users with uh, tourist recommendations for the Belgian coast. And essentially, they're very interested in the UI in particular and how to get consent in a manner that is uh, stipulated in the GDPR. And then we have uh, Deutsche Telekom. Deutsche Telekom have an existing application and it's used to monitor the, the quality of the network. Now, the, the data is anonymous uh, that's used for, for this monitoring. And they're wondering if they can actually repurpose the existing application uh, with the consent of the data subjects in order to uh, use the actual personal data and not the anonymized data for a different purpose. And that purpose is they would like to share it with a subsidiary known as Motion Logic in order to optimize services uh, and infrastructure within the city. And the third use case is from the financial services perspective, where Thomson Reuters provide uh, know your customer services for people who are looking for loans, etc. So in, in special, we have several technical foundations. This is not uh, to be seen as an architecture diagram, but really the components that we're developing. And today we're going to focus on three aspects. So the first one is actually the policy. So the policy language itself and how do we represent consent and regulatory constraints. The second um, part that we will focus on is the, the actual engine, which is our big data engine, which builds upon um, Big Data Europe, which was another H2020 project, and uh, demonstrates how we can do compliance checking and provide uh, transparency, and also how we can integrate with existing line of business applications. And the third topic is actually the data processors and the data subjects and the DPOs. You know, how do they actually interact with the system in terms of the front end, and in particular, the dashboards. Essentially, our policy language um, came from the legal inquiry process. So when we started out in special and we were doing the legal assessment of the use cases, the lawyers would always ask what data, what purpose, uh, how is the data processed, where is it stored, for how long and with whom is it disclosed. And, and later we discovered the reason why they ask these questions is essentially they're mapping to different uh, obligations and requirements that are in the GDPR. And they want to find out, you know, which rules uh, in the GDPR are relevant for the particular use case. So we decided, OK, if we want to automate the process and we want to be able to automate the consent and automate the business processes, this would be a good basis for our policy language. And we have this transparency ledger. So initially, we wanted to basically check the, the business process to see if the business process was compliant. But every system is very unique and very different. And oftentimes, it's spaghetti code. So we thought, how do we actually give something more immediate to, to companies? And essentially, every system usually has an, an error log, an audit trail, a security log. So we decided to repurpose the existing logging mechanisms to record the data collected, the purpose, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can automatically check uh, compliance. Now, we have to point out that we're working with companies who want to demonstrate compliance. So essentially, when the data protection officer knocks on the door and says, you know, show me that you have complied, then they can demonstrate that compliance. Um, 
here is just one slide on our policy language and you can see here in figure 1.1 we actually have a grammar for our policy language and you will see there we have the data the purpose the processing recipients and storage i've already mentioned and our policy language is encoded using owl so it's a web ontology language and the core model underpinning that is the resource description framework and this is a standard coming from the w3c um, here, this slide, uh, I give you some pointers with respect to the policy language. So the latest version of the language is described in, in our deliverable D2.5, which you will find up on our website. But also we have an unofficial draft specification. You see it there on the left-hand side uh, in, a, in a style very similar to what they use in the W3C. And this work feeds into a W3C community group, which we set up. And I'll talk about that in just one minute. Um, we also have the syntax and expressivity of our log. So here you actually see all of the log entry information. And that log entry has the same core components that are in the policy language. And we can have different types of logs. So we can log the, the latest policy or the latest consent or the revocation of the consent. Or we can log the actual data processing or the actual data sharing event. And again, we have the resources. So you will find the information for the log in deliverable D2.7. But we have an unofficial uh, specification as well that's available on the special website. Uh, and the third uh, component that we have here is the um, regulatory compliance profile. So essentially, the W3C have a standard which is called ODRL, Open Digital Rights Language, and it's primarily used for expressing licenses. So what we did was we looked to see if we could develop a profile or a derivative of that policy language in order to uh, specify regulatory constraint and business policies. And the reason why we did this was because many companies are already investing in ODRL and ODRL is a standard and we think it has huge potential in the future. In terms of each of the slides I've already shown you, uh, if we have a paper on the topic, I've just listed it down the bottom of the slides. And we have the resources available for the ODRL profile as well from our website. And the last thing I want to mention is the uh, Data Privacy Vocabularies and Controls Community Group. So if you've ever been involved in standardization in the W3C, the very first um, activity is to set up a community group around something that you believe could potentially be standardized. And then what you do is you come up with the charter for that community group. You get people who are interested. We have participants from our project, but but also we've gone much broader than that. So you can see we currently have 59 participants. Uh, we had a couple of face-to-face -face meetings where we started to prioritize what we would work on. And one of the things was a very high priority was a vocabulary, a common vocabulary uh, in terms of privacy. And we released the, or the community group, because it's much broader than special, released the first draft of uh, the vocabulary in July this year. And they're still actively working on it. And uh, essentially this group will continue even after special has finished and all of the resources that I have shown you will be available to the community group if the community want to take them further and use them. So here's just a summary slide of our exploitable results. I've taken you through the resources, the policy language, the special vocabularies, the log vocabulary, the ODRL regulatory compliance profile and the vocabularies coming from the community group. Orush will take you through the compliance checking and the back end uh, aspects, and Philip will later take you through the consent and transparency interfaces. So that's it from my side, and I'm going to hand you over to Orush.
Harush, we cannot hear you yet, yet, so you can unmute yourself. Not yet. Okay, so um, I think it is work now. Yeah. So you should be able to hear me out. I hope you can also see my screen. Um, so thank you, Sabrina. Um, as uh, the rest of you have just seen, uh, one of the, the goals of the special platform is to um, give data subjects control over their own data. So this means that they should be able to visualize the consent they have given um, and that they should be able to change their consent at any moment in time. They should also uh, have the ability to obtain a historical overview of the pr processing of their data in light of the consent given at the time. Now, on the other hand, the data controllers and processors need to be able to log their activities so they can prove compliance to a data protection authority, for instance, if necessary. Uh, and ideally, this process would have little to no impact on their existing operations and processes, um, even if the amount of data processing enhanced logging would grow. And, and lastly, it's, it's not only the data subjects, uh, the controllers and the processors too would benefit from a historical overview of events uh, in, a consent, in consent and processing logs. So to enable all of that, there are certain key building blocks that need to be considered. Um, the, the architecture elements we're going to look at, um, and not necessarily in this order, in this order are first of all, <coughs> the authentication and authorization. So how we will see how we ensure security and protect uh, personal data throughout the platform. Uh, we'll then look at how we manage consent on the backend side. Uh, also how we ensure transparency and compliance on the backend. Um, and interact with the user facing applications. We will also look at logging, uh, which is a key factor here. Um, we will show you then how we check for compliance um, relying on the, the policy language that Sabrina described earlier. Um, then we will also show you how we catalog all personal data distributed um, across distributed data sources. And we will finally uh, show you how we allow external applications to interact uh, with the special platform. So uh, what is important to note first is that uh, the architecture is built with Apache Kafka at its foundation. Um, Apache Kafka, uh, in case you are not familiar with it, is a distributed streaming platform. But perhaps in this context, the easiest way to think of it is um, as a fault-tolerant append-only log. Um, and, and this is really key here because what it does is it provide us, uh, provides us with uh, that immutability aspect that we require for ensuring transparency uh, and compliance. Um, and it also lets us create separate logs or topics uh, as they're called in Kafka for, for different purposes. On top of that, uh, it can act as a buffer um, and it's also a message broker. So it, it minimizes the necessary coupling between different architecture components. Um, it's also worth mentioning that it's, it's mature. So it's, uh, it's used by some of the largest companies in the world. So we also know that it provides a good foundation for, build, for building robust distributed systems. And uh, we, we really use Kafka throughout the special platform as you will see in a couple of seconds. Uh, so what you see here is part of the architecture that deals with consent management. Um, so we have explored different interfaces for consent management, uh, and Philip will present some of that work in uh, a couple of minutes. Um, in terms of security, the special platform relies on OpenID Connect for authentication and OAuth 2 for authorization, both of which are industry standards, uh, which is, I would say, crucial for an environment used for managing uh, personal data. But uh, what is important to stress on the backend side is that we, we support two database solutions here. So um, I would say the, the reason behind this is historical more than anything. Um, and we, we do have uh, demo setups available on GitHub for both. Uh, both RethinkDB and MongoDB are document stores, as you may know, uh, and both can persist native JSON. Because our API layer communicates using JSON, uh, this aspect just makes things a bit easier. Um, 
one difference perhaps is that um, unlike RethinkDB, MongoDB offers full support for multi-document asset transactions, which can be seen uh, as an advantage, but I, I think this is less important. Um, and both databases also support um, streaming changes on, on the data, um, which is very important, uh, uh, which is because it's necessary to populate the audit log. Um, the, the audit log uh, is necessary to record um, the changes uh, in data subjects consent over time. So in, ca in case a data protection authority wants to review those logs, uh, they have uh, an immutable record of those changes, again, in a dedicated Kafka topic. Um, and the, here's uh, what one data subject policy looks like. Um, what, what we consider a data subject policy is essentially a collection of what we call simpler policies. And a simple policy basically explains what data can be processed under which conditions. So here we have a, a policy consisting of two simpler policies. The first one here says that the data subject um, consents to having their location data processed um, for well, any processing can be performed as long as its purpose as long as the purpose is event recommendations. The recipient can be any recipient, and the storage can be. Uh, well, the data can be stored for any duration. And of course, these policies can be a lot more complex than this. Uh, the storage, for instance, could say, uh, my data can be processed only uh, inside the EU uh, and only for seven days, for instance. Um, and as I said before, you can have a topic per purpose. So what we're proposing is to dedicate a topic per application processing personal data. Um, this, the split up here is important to ensure performance, but it's also not the only thing that can be done to improve performance as we will see uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, as you can also see here on the left, uh, I don't know if I can highlight this. Right, so here on the left, we propose that any request for, for personal data um, goes through uh, what we call the personal data gateway. So what the service does is take a request for processing, including the category of personal data, the purpose, the storage policy, and so on, and uh, put the request on the appropriate topic in Kafka. So the gateway also provides two separate endpoints depending on the request format. So you can submit your request as either JSON or OWL if you need to check uh, more elaborate policies, for instance. The, the ping box here is the, the special reasoner, the, the compliance engine, the compliance checker, whatever you want to call it, uh, which ingests the processing requests and the data subjects policies, and it checks for subsumption. So it essentially checks whether, one, uh, whether, whether an application policy is covered by an existing user or data subject policy. Uh, the result is then written again to a dedicated Kafka topic, uh, in this case, a front-end application log, uh, allowing easy consumption by front-end applications, uh, which is, again, something that Philip will demo. Um, there is also a state log, uh, which is uh, simply a compacted Kafka topic where the compliance checker can checkpoint the latest off offset it has processed. Uh, this is done for resilient reasons, um, as it allows the system to easily restore its state in case it crashes or needs to restart. Um, the JSON format that ends up on the application Kafka topic uh, looks something like this. So um, this, you will notice, looks similar to the data subject policy we saw earlier. And this is what allows us to check for compliance. Now, because the policies can be a lot more complex, as I said earlier, and because we're, we rely on the special policy language, this compliance check is actually a lot more powerful than, than your typical rule engine, for instance. Um, now, this is an overview of the entire architecture, um, or at least one of the possible setup. So this setup specifically does exactly what you saw earlier. So um, as they process personal data, applications here on the left, uh, write the processing events to a processing log which is then inspected for compliance. Now, um, here we split the compliance log into two. 
Uh, one is conveniently called the compliance log, uh, and the other is called the, the compliance log, and the other is called the front-end application log. Now, this is another uh, split which is done for, for performance reasons. So other apps that need more immediate feedback can consume the information intended for them specifically. So uh, this also means that you can optimize the information stored in the logs based uh, on purpose. So for instance, an application that just needs a yes or no answer does not need the full policy the compliance check relates to. Um, and this brings us to the next important aspect of this setup. So uh, what this setup does is ex post compliance checking. So that is, uh, it logs events after they have happened, after an application has processed some personal data, which uh, in certain cases, perhaps not what you want. So what you often want is to know whether you can process data before you actually process it. Um, so, what this setup needs to enable ex ante compliance checking is this feedback loop here at the bottom. Um, so here, instead of submitting processing events, applications actually submit their requests requests for processing, um, of requests for processing for processing of personal data, um, and these requests are then expected for for compliance. So the answers are then fed back to the requesting applications. Um, and and uh, this is, I think, a good use case for splitting your compliance log, as I explained earlier. So what the requesting application here needs is a simple yes or no. So um, if you want to optimize the setup for performance, you can easily drop the rest of the metadata here. Um, and uh, if you're wondering how performant such a setup is, uh, we have run some very extensive tests uh, on the platform. Um, our testing setup produces a stream of uh, 1,000 users, which each, each user generates one event every second. So that is, um, we evaluate an event stream that on average generates one event every millisecond. Uh, so this is, of course, on a logarithmic scale. Um, and in most cases, after an initial warm up, uh, the platform stabilizes at around one to two milliseconds. So the performance is. Uh, obviously also improved by adding more compliance checkers. Um, and for those of you who would like to know more about this, I suggest you have a look at our deliverable D3.5, I think scalability and robustness testing version two. Uh, one important thing to note is that we can actually do even better than this. So we were recently trying to optimize the platform for a scenario where um, a telecommunications operator uh, needs to process thousands of events coming from base stations per second. Uh, and the best result we achieved there with a highly specialized setup, I would say, uh, was, around, was around 200 microseconds, uh, which means we could process around 5,000 events per second. Um, now, just another quick look at the overall platform architecture before we move on. Um, uh, I guess I still owe you an explanation for the two big pieces of the platform I haven't talked about yet. So namely um, this part uh, here on the right uh, and, and this part, this block here on the left. So what we'll do first is have a look at the, the block on the left. Uh, so what the personal data inventory is, um, is an AI-driven personal data cataloging solution. So uh, we say it's AI-driven, it's, it's not a rule-based, so um, it can discover more than just your typical uh, PII, such as names and emails, um, and it can do so across both structured and unstructured uh, data sources to, we say, semantically lift the discovered data. And what I mean by that is uh, it, it generates an RDF model, um, an RDF model per data source or per data subject, uh, depending on how you look at it. And, and for this reason, we also say that it is an identity aware personal data inventory. So more specifically for every data subject, we, we generate uh, what we call an identity graph, uh, which is essentially a map of all personal data attributes belonging to the data subject and their physical locations. Um, 
And we see it's semantically lifted also because we use standard vocabularies and taxonomies wherever possible. So for example, uh, we describe the, the data sources in the catalog using DCAT AP, um, which is a European Commission application profile uh, or an extension of DCAT. If you're familiar with the open data space, uh, DCAT is a standard for describing data catalogs and the catalog data sets. Uh, this gives us the flexibility to generalize the catalog to perhaps an enterprise data catalog uh, or even an open data catalog, of course, without the, the personal data, uh, because we have that map of all data across all data sources within an enterprise. And, and for the data subject part, for the identity graphs, we can rely on the results of the data privacy vocabularies and controls community group, uh, which is another result of the special project that Sabrina mentioned earlier. Um, so going back to our architecture, uh, what the personal data gateway can also do here is upon receiving a positive response from the compliance checker, the gateway can ask the personal data inventory for the actual data. So instead of just telling the application, yes, you can process the data or no, you cannot do it, uh, you can also send back the actual data value directly from the relevant data source because the personal data inventory has that map of all data. Um, but what I would stress here is that uh, it is important that this step does not happen any earlier than this. Okay? Even though we use Kafka throughout the, the platform, uh, this is one purpose you don't want to use Kafka for because Kafka is, once again, an append-only lock. So whatever data you place on it cannot be selectively removed without affecting the other data. Um, and, and we already know that the GDPR gives uh, data subjects certain rights, including the so-called right to be forgotten. So if you place personal data um, on an immutable log, you will not be able to uh, comply with a request to be forgotten, at least not without affecting the other data on that log. And this uh, brings us to another important use case for the personal data inventory. Uh, because the inventory, as I said earlier, has the map of all the physical locations of all personal data per data subject, it can also be used to help controllers address data subject requests. So in addition to a request to be forgotten, um, a data subject also has the right to request all their data in a popular machine readable format. So on the front end side, uh, what we allow is um, we, we let data subjects submit such requests via their personal privacy dashboards. Um, and then every request is once again, for transparency reasons, logged using a dedicated Kafka topic. Uh, once it has been submitted and placed on that Kafka topic, the personal data inventory can pick it up and a data protection officer can then evaluate the request. Now, in theory, we could uh, also automate this part of the process and uh, automatically generate the response, um, but we do not do so because, first of all, not all requests are always justified. And uh, second, we, we're also aware that uh, big companies have their own internal processes and policies that often involve many different departments, so we uh, decided to stick to the semi-manual pro process instead. Uh, but once the request has been validated, the personal data inventory can send the response back to the transparency and compliance backend. Um, and this event is, is uh, again logged. So there is a full trail of the process, including the controller's response. Um, but the actual data is once again communicated directly to the transparency and compliance backend rather than via Kafka for the reason uh, I explained earlier. And the, the response format we use is here is JSON-LD because JSON-LD um, comes with the, uh, the, the semantics which uh, are stored in the personal data inventory. Um, and since we have finally touched upon that uh, last part here, uh, that is the communication with the front end, um, I guess I, we, I could also explain that, that last part of the architecture. Um, I already explained the reason why we would split up the compliance log. Um, and here, the front-end application log is another obvious example uh, because this log can be consumed by the front-end without impacting the other parts of the system. So we, we also uh, allow dashboards to consume it in two different ways. So 
Uh, one way to do it is directly, so via the transparency and compliance backend. So they can the, the compliance uh, transparency and compliance backend they can directly hook into the Kafka topic and pick up the information from there. Uh, and the other one is via Logstash. In case you're not familiar with Logstash, it is part of the so-called uh, Elk stack. The, the Elk stack consists of Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, uh, E-L-K, hence Elk. Um, Logstash is a server-side data processing pipeline. So its, it's job here is to ingest the data from the front-end application log, um, then combine it or enrich it with metadata from the personal data inventory. Uh, so that metadata can be labels or physical locations, depending on what you want to display on the front end side, and then feed it to Elasticsearch. Um, Elasticsearch is, um, can be seen either as another document store or as a distributed JSON-based search and uh, analytics engine. Um, and then this data is then uh, fed to Kibana. Uh, and Kibana is the GUI part of the Elk stack. Uh, it, it lets us easily generate reusable embeddable dashboard widgets. Um, it, but that's again the front end and I will stop here and I will let Philip uh, tell you more about it in just a second. Um, Philip, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I assume you can now hear me and I'm going to present you the uh, front ends we developed within special and this is now a complete different um, side of the whole project because now we're uh, looking at the project uh, from the user perspective and uh, just to, to uh, look uh, back at the actor and role model that we see here that uh, now we've seen uh, the, how the controllers interact with a special system so that they basically uh, um, push events into the event log using the uh, ontology and taxonomy and the policy language and then the compliance checker that could be of interest for authorities and data protection officers. So now we want to focus on the data subject and uh, the user uh, in the end that wants to uh, manage their privacy and execute data privacy rights that are granted by the general data protection regulation. So uh, for this we developed what we call a privacy dashboard. So it's an interface to access the personal data that has been processed and to offer data subjects uh, means to express um, yeah, privacy preferences and also give them opportunities to, to act basically to say well I want my uh, data to be rectified, erased or um, um, uh, I want uh, also just the simple access to my personal data. And this is what we found in, in user studies that basically when it comes to the user um, we need to translate the language used in the log and in the policies uh, and completely abstract and explain them to users. And if we look at, um, at uh, how a privacy dashboard depends on various factors uh, in, form, in, in terms of the design itself, so we identified that the user group is only one factor that uh, plays a role in, in the eventual uh, design of the privacy dashboard but also, of course, the legislation itself. And the controller and its domain is uh, also a fact that it heavily depends how this dashboard should be designed. And we've seen that there's also interrelations between the factors. So, for example, the controller uh, uh, basically also depends on the law. So some controllers are subject to certain aspects of the law, some not. And also the tasks that are um, foreseen with the privacy dashboard to be fulfilled and heavily depend on the data that is actually processed and also the data again depends on the control by itself. So as we see it's a very complex constellation that uh, basically has a huge impact on how this privacy dashboard should be designed and just to make this even more complex is the user groups itself there are 
very heterogeneous. So user groups differ very much uh, in terms of privacy attitudes, but also um, experience with uh, computers and web technologies and so on and so forth. So our outcome is basically that there can't be just a single dashboard that serves all purposes, all scenarios, all controllers, but these need to be always aligned with these factors in mind. And um, so for, to, to ease this a bit, we used a data taxonomy to explain users basically in which context their privacy data was processed. And there Bruce Schneier did, uh, um, did uh, published a data taxonomy uh, with regard to online social networks. Uh, which is intended to, to basically enable data subjects to, to categorize data. So he, he, um, he describes service data, which is any kind of data that is required in order to provide the service in question, which is the name, for example, address, uh, email address, or payment information, if it's a, a, a paid service. Disclose data is any data that the data subject intentionally provides on their own profile or page. So just for to remember you, uh, to remind you, it's an online social network context he's speaking of. And trusted data is uh, any data that the data subject intentionally provides on other youth users' profile pages. Incidental data is any kind of data provided by other users of the service about the data subject itself, for example, a photo. Behavioral data is any kind of data the service provider observes about the data subject while he or she uses the service. And derived data is any kind of information that was derived from the uh, categories above. So for online social networks, I think this could be a very useful tool to categorize personal data and help users to um, explain uh, under which uh, conditions and in which context their personal data was processed, but it's obviously not a generic uh, taxonomy. So on our first step, we um, basically generalized this data taxonomy and formed the categories uh, intentional data, incidental data, behavioral data, and derived data. So intentional data is any piece of data the data subject deliberately discloses to the controller, fully aware of the disclosure. Incidental data refers to information relating to the data subject shared by another entity with the controller, so other users or other sources. Behavioral data is now any data obtained from monitoring the data subject's behavior, and this is regardless of his or her awareness of the monitoring process, and derived data, again, is just any information derived, inferred, uh, or obtained from other categories or the combination of them. So this was our first uh, core uh, design principle to to say we want to get the data that is uh, that is described by the event log and map it to these categories in order to give users some information about the process and context. And now I'm going to show you what the end result of the privacy dashboard demo, which is also accessible via this URL. And if you're prompted with a login mask, then this user can be used uh, to to test. And I will now show you screenshots um, of the end results. So this is now the privacy dashboard in its current state. And um, we are having a dashboard for a particular service, which is here called Finder, uh, which is basically a, a recommender service for places around you. So obviously location data is processed in this scenario. And on the left-hand side, we have uh, the navigation with my profile, uh, then information about the service itself, then my data, my activity log, and my permissions. And as you've seen, we avoided uh, lots of the terminology uh, of the special vocabulary because we found in user studies that they could be confusing to users, and we rather tried to uh, stick to wordings that are more in line with the user's expectations. So under my profile, now we list all the intent, all the service data, so all the hard facts about uh, the data subject, which could be the email address used for authentication, the username, um, and the password, but not the password itself, of course, uh, the real name, physical address, date of birth, 
birth or banking account information, whatever is needed uh, and described by Bruce Schneier's taxonomy as service data. Then we have another category which would be uh, learn about data we process while you're using our service. So this is now all the data that is basically could be derived data or also um, um, the, the uh, behavioral information uh, uh, obtained from, from uh, the monitoring processes. So all the information that the user might not be aware of, um, uh, of uh, being uh, processed or even obtained, uh, although they are uh, part of the service. So in the next step, we want to uh, um, find more information about uh, the application itself. So it's Finder, and we are legally uh, required by the GDPR to list a full list of the controllers and the processors. And here we found that the, the term, the terminology itself is very confusing for data subjects. So it's, these are legal terms and um, should be explained. So when users uh, hover over one of those question marks here, um, then they get a text, uh, an explanation of what a controller is in this uh, sense. And that now we find a list of the uh, controllers itself. So it could be multiple controllers because there's the concept of joint controllers. And also, it's important to explain these company names, role, this company's role within the uh, service provision. So that's why there's another question mark basically here that when users hover over it, they see, ah, okay, this is the service provider. But for example, we see here that there is Microsoft Corporation as a processor and uh, users will basically would ask themselves what is the connection between those two companies and then it's uh, important to explain this relationship as well and in this case it would be that uh, for this service finder uh, Microsoft Azure is uh, used uh, as a um, platform as a service provider. So um, if this card here is extended we would get additional information on the company but what is more important actually the links to the data protection officer, the privacy policy, and the website to obtain more information and to also address um, privacy concerns to these uh, companies. And let's go to the My Data tab, basically. So this is something that is very important for users when they access or review their, their um, um, data. Uh, with regard to a certain service, they want to see it, they want to see when was it processed, what was derived from it, and they want a visual um, feedback to see what uh, what is the data about. So of course for location data it's quite obvious that you cannot offer geolocations uh, to the user and say well this is what we process, but you need to enrich the data you have uh, where to provide uh, in fact transparency. Um, the same is if, uh, and this makes it very complex, uh, the same if you have movies, so you have you process uh, a movie history of the user or browsing history, uh, it's usually uh, good for the usability of the privacy dashboard that you give additional information, not just a title, uh, but additional information on, on uh, obtained from, from a open APIs or, or whatsoever. And what we see here now with these three dots is that the user can open a menu um, where basically uh, the, the user can request rectification or erasure of the, of the particular data item. And this erasure does not uh, only happen uh, automatically, but there's also a bit of a, of a formal uh, request uh, process involved where basically a text is generated, uh, auto-generated, um, uh, specifying uh, the request itself and the data itself. And this written request is in addition to, to uh, everything that happens on the log uh, underneath, also sent to the controller. And I will come back to this uh, in a moment, why this is also of interest for the, for the uh, data protection officer. Um, this is now to jump briefly over the uh, event log itself. So we've seen that uh, there's a page uh, dedicated to the event log itself. And this is uh, meant to show the user at which time certain or how in, uh, uh, 
which time data was processed and to what extent, so how many processing events happened. And this can be also matched against the usage patterns of the of the um, of the user with regard to the, the to the application to see okay was probably uh, a lot of background processing going on because I didn't use the service but uh, here it shows that lots of my personal data was processed and also of course the whole contents of the activity log is displayed here um, so that users can see what happened uh, in very much detail. Um, on the event log um, and with regard to their personal data. Uh, last but not least, of course, the permissions and the policies as we've seen it. Um, we found that users usually need a description of what the policy means and usually they are used to just agreeing or not. And usually they just agree to a set of policies and not to individual policies. What uh, they found still beneficial that they can uh, have the option to disagree with certain aspects of a privacy policy and not. And as we've seen here, that there's a, a short description of the policy, but it also, we found, uh, needs to be extended by additional information. For example, what happens if I do not consent with a policy or which risks are involved when I consent to a certain policy? And these information, of course, are a bit harder to derive from the event log. That these could be uh, statements by the controller explaining the user what happens if uh, consent is not given, what kind of functionality cannot be provided uh, if uh, consent is not given for this uh, policy. And now, uh, very short, I will show you the DPO dashboard. So we also developed the DPO dashboard. So all the requests that are coming from the data subjects are also uh, aggregated. Uh, at, in, a, in a DPO dashboard, this is also accessible via this link and the username and password are the same. And here we see the DPO dashboard, which is in uh, from the layout and design quite similar to the privacy dashboard, but has certain um, uh, other options to show. For example, uh, there's an activity heat map, uh, but this activity heat map now shows, um, of course, just how many requests for erasure, rectification, or portability, or uh, right to access. Um, uh, what, what, when did these uh, events occur, uh, requests occur, and in one intensity to see that DPO see, okay, there are certain uh, developments within the company, some changes to the privacy policy that led to an increase of requests for rectification or erasure, for example. Um, also, uh, uh, if we are talking about international services, then we see that it could be useful to see where these requests come from, so which countries are uh, more privacy managing and which are not. And also, of course, the request types to see, okay, is uh, a rectification actually something that is used by uh, data subjects or do they always want to uh, delete their data or request erasure of their data? And last but not least, of course, the DPO of a, of a company can always uh, look at these requests on an individual basis and if uh, needed also forward those requests to a certain unit in the company itself. Although because we are, have all the information uh, 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 attached to one request, so the application uh, uh, that is um, um, uh, um, sorry, the, the application itself that uh, uh, was used by the user um, is also in the information of the request. So actually, this information can be directly forwarded to the responsible units in the company. And this is from my side. And um, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, all the, the presenters. I think that uh, it's been a very, very interesting webinar. Uh, we have uh, very few time for questions, but I think that uh, at least we can handle a couple of them. So we have one question uh, ab about uh, the use of a Kafka versus the use of blockchain. Uh, I don't know if you consider that, uh, but uh, yeah, that, that's a question that is uh, already on the on the line. I don't know who can tackle this, but uh, why do you use Kafka instead of blockchain or if they are complementary I, somehow? 
I can respond. So um, initially we uh, did look into blockchain because of the fact that we thought well, it's immutable and um, essentially it would be a shared view and it would provide more transparency. And in particular, we were looking at Hyperledger because it also integrates very well um, with the existing infrastructure within companies and you have authentication and access control mechanisms. But the challenge is that essentially, how do you handle the right to erasure or um, the right to rectification? because of the fact that once it's in there, uh, you, you cannot uh, remove it. And there was lots of discussions on, well, we wouldn't store the actual data, we would only store a pointer to the data. But at the same time, if, um, if I'm on some sort of criminal register and I was put there uh, by accident, uh, I will be going to the courts to try and get that removed. So we we felt that it was very risky. There's also an excellent article uh, which was uh, produced by the European Union on the legality of uh, blockchain in, in terms of GDPR and compliance with GDPR. And there are several questions there that are gray areas. So this is why we elected to go with Kafka. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have another question for you because uh, if someone here, for instance, or, or any organization would like to, to use your platform, how how do they should they start? Should, should they contact you? There is there any way of uh, uh, knowing exactly the steps to be, to be followed. So and everything. If somebody, oh, oh you no, take it for us. I was just going to say no, no. that um, everything we we showed today is uh, publicly publicly available um, on GitHub. So what they can essentially do is they can go there um, and they can install any of the components we we showed today, um, and they can play with them uh, for a little while. If they, have, if they have questions, they can always uh, ask their questions either directly on GitHub um, or by sending out one of us an email. Uh, we'll be happy to respond. Um, I think that's, that's pretty much it. There's no real formal process behind it today. Yeah, and in terms of the uh, policy language and the log vocabulary and the vocabularies from the community group, um, we have all of the draft specifications there and, and they're welcome to contact me or contact the community group. Uh, there are several other organizations and projects that have already started to use the vocabularies uh, that we have. And our plan is to hopefully move all of this activity into the community group so that we can have a, a, an extended group where we can expand upon our initial results and special. Okay, thank you. And uh, just one last question that uh, is related to the, the effort to, to set up uh, uh, your framework, for instance, for a specific organization. I guess that is the, it really depends on the type of organization, the type of uh, request that they may have. You mentioned, for instance, a telecom company with uh, many events per second, that uh, there are probably others that uh, are less, uh, uh, that they have less event per second or even per, per, per hour, but uh, uh, how much time or how, how long that it would take for an organization to set up your the configuration and the policies and everything? Do you have some idea about that? So th this really depends on the use case. Um, if the, the goal is to set up a big data pipeline where um, you just need to consult the the special platform for um, compliance. Um, I, I think this could be done pretty fast, but if you need to integrate mul multiple data sources, if you need to integrate with your existing um, authentication authorization systems, uh, this is this can turn into a more difficult exercise. Um, it really depends on, on the on the use case and the the size of the, the enterprise you're dealing with. Okay, so thank you very much. I think uh, we don't have any more questions here and it's a little bit over the time that we, we had. So I, will, I would like to thank you, uh, all the three of you for, for the nice presentations that we have. I think it's, uh, it, they have been very enlightening and also thank you to the, all the 
the, the attendees uh, for for the for for staying uh, until now. As you know, we will provide the, the all the presentations and uh, the recording of the of the webinar through the webinar page that is uh, listed at the at the bottom of the uh, of the of the slide that I am presenting now. And it's the BDBA, uh, the Data Value EU uh, website, where you can find all the, the all these resources, not only from this particular webinar, but for, for the others that we had in the past and, the, and we will have in the future. So again, thank you very much, uh, all of you, and uh, well, have a nice day and a very nice weekend. And thanks for facilitating, Thomas. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.